All right, here we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this third of hopefully many series of Meet the Musician series hosted by Friends Home and Kennett. My name is Brenton McGee and I am the Performing Arts Associate here at Friends Home and Kennett. And this month, it is my privilege and honor to welcome my friend, Dr. Kirsten Kunkel. Dr. Kirsten Kunkel is a soprano who has an outstanding singing voice and an actress with a beautiful, ethereal, powerful, fiery, bewitching voice. She has sung tons of operas. I can't even name them all. La Boheme, uh, Le Nose di Figaro, Don Giovanni, Dido and Aeneas, so many more, as well as modern operas. Uh, she has recorded extensively through the Comic Opera Guild and her recordings are collected in the Library of Congress the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian Institute, where she is on the list of classical Native American artists and musicians. She is also the co-founder and artistic director of Wilmington Concert Opera. Uh, her and another colleague, Marissa, founded this company in Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, she has done a marvelous job running a company and in fact, that was where I, um, I actually met her before that company in a connection with a singer named John Derenkamp, who was the singer of the Metropolitan Opera. And um, it, uh, it was a privilege to get to know her. And she invited me to sing uh, in her um, Wilmington Concert Opera recently as a recital that I did with her. Um, she has a website, www. K-I-R-S-T-E-N-C-K-U-N-K-L-E dot com. And she has her bachelor's degree. All her degrees are in voice. She has a bachelor's degree from Bowling Green, University of Bowling Green, and a master's of music and doctorate of music arts at the University of Michigan, one of the best schools of voice. And today she's going to be printing, presenting such an interesting topic and a topic that you don't hear too much of especially in the voice world, which is her doctor dissertation, Maintaining Native Heritage, Psalms Based on the Poetry of Alexander Kossi, if I said his name correct. So without further ado, here is Dr. Kirsten Kunkel. The floor is yours. Let's give her a hand, everybody. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Branton. Appreciate it so much. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a preface of who I am in addition to what Branton told you. Um, the reason that you're hearing about these songs today is indeed because I commissioned them uh, during my doctorate. And the reason I commissioned them is because there was a huge lack of art song with any Native American um, connection in in classical Western canon. But I also had a moment where I had this realization that because there wasn't a lot there, I could do something that was also very personal. And that was take the poetry of my great, great, great uncle, who was a huge name in Native American literature and poetry um, and set, have his work set to music and per, premiere them and perform them. So I'm going to tell you about those songs that I premiered while I was in my doctorate today. You'll hopefully get to hear some of those and get to um, understand a little bit of why they are important to me. And then I'm happy to answer any questions once we're finished. So without any further ado, I will be presenting Maintaining Native Heritage, songs based on the poetry of Alex Posey. Alexander Posey, along with our current poet laureate, Joy Harjo, is among the most famous of all Muscogee poets. During his lifetime, he worked as a journalist, editor, and poet, all while attempting to maintain his Native American heritage during the time of the Dawes Commission. Posey was consistently divided between finding success in the European American world by writing in English about acceptable topics such as nature and maintaining his passion for the continuation of his Native American ideals by writing in dialect about Native history and politics. Being a descendant of Alexander Posey, I continue to work toward bridging the gap between modern society and the Muscogee culture 
in the field of classical music. During 2006 to 2007, I commissioned and premiered as a classical vocalist numerous songs based on the texts of Alex Posey. The pianist for the premiere was Patrick Harvey. The composers, excluding myself, a Native American and European American, were all volunteer European Americans writing in the classical Western art music style. To my knowledge, there had not been a Native American poet whose works had been set as art songs until I commissioned these works. The goal of the commissions was to attempt to bridge a gap between Native American folk music and poetry and classical Western art song. Although much has been written about Posey and his conflict between the Native American and European American worlds, the focus of this lecture is to introduce the original songs that were written for the premiere. These songs exemplify the idea of blending numerous European musical styles and the writings of Posey, an established Native American poet divided between European American ideals and retention of Native American culture. The end result was a world premiere of 16 songs, all based on the poetry of Posey, culminating in a melting pot of classical Western musical styles. Posey's writing provided a sense of cohesion between the Native American and European American worlds and dramatically influenced future Native American literature. The goal of the premiere was to do the same for Posey's poetry once set to music. Posey's life and influence has been well documented in Daniel Littlefield's studies. The majority of this lecture is based upon my assessment of each song. Because of the unique nature of this project, the work is solely my own and my interpretation of the compositions combined with interviews and program notes from the composers. Nature's Blessings and a Vision were composed during the summer of 2006 by Nicole Elise de Paolo. These compositions comprise a duo of songs in completely different styles meant to be sung together. Nature's Blessings features an arpeggiated piano accompaniment combined with a fairly melismatic vocal line. Influenced by Schubert's compositional style in Der Lindenbaum, de Paolo's Nature's Blessings composition is an up-tempo song with a two against three rhythm. In contrast, a vision is chordal and features a standard ABA form. Both works are composed with a focus on word painting and expression. The sound of robins is suggested in the piano accompaniment in the first composition, as well as a definite pensive mood in the second. I premiered these songs with the composer at the University of Michigan Women Composers Concert in the autumn of 2006. They have been performed by pianist R. Strohschein and me at the Toledo Monday Musicale Concert in December of 20, 2006, and by pianist Helen Meacham and me at Lincoln University in 2010. And yes, that is Lincoln University right down the road from you. I taught there for four years. So I would like to share with you videos of some of these pieces. I can't share all of them. We just don't have time, and I don't have great video of all of them. But the ones I do have, I wanted to share with you that I that I think you'll enjoy most. Um, the first one, I'm going to try to do share what? screen here. A Vision by Nicole Elise DePaulo. This was one of the first uh, pieces on the program of Posey's songs that I commissioned. Uh, with me is Helen Meacham. This was at Lincoln University in 2010.
So that was again, a vision by Nicole Elise de Paolo. Going on, the next piece on the program was called A Glimpse of Spring. And it was composed during the winter of 2006 and 2007 by Tom Odermott. Odermott's composition led, lends itself to contemporary popular musical style, as opposed to the standard art song. The melody focuses on the middle range of the soprano with emphasis on creating a mood as opposed to focusing on word painting of in individual lines and phrases. The introduction and postlude are comprised of long chord clusters which contradict the forward moving feeling of the piano and vocal collaboration during the composition. Rhythm is a challenge in this composition as the vocal line changes slightly numerous times and the piano is almost always in constant syncopation of the vocal line. The end result is a relaxed, aesthetically comfortable feeling of spring approaching. Mother's Song was composed during the summer and autumn of 2006 by Aaron Zimmerman. This composition opens with a thought interrupted by a long moment of a vocal echo within the phrase, I hear a distant melody. This idea sets up the entire composition. This song seems best compared to an operatic aria or even a mad scene. The scene is set within moments of the first notes and develops rapidly. The composition seems almost improvisatory in style. Although musical elements do repeat, octave leaps, rapidly ascending, then descending perfect fourths. There's an air of mystery to the composition that is created because the music tends not to go where expected harmonically. With varying degrees of dynamics and intensity, Zimmerman creates a unique composition in a loosely harmonic ABA form. And I will share this one with you as well. This is from the premiere. The, compo uh, the, the pianist is Patrick Harvey, and this was in 2006. This is um, Mother Song by Aaron Zimmerman.
Um, I misspoke on that. That was performed in 2007, not 2006. So next up is Pity. Pity was composed during the early autumn of 2006 by Dan Schellhaus. The composition is divided into four distinct sections. The first section consists of a piano introduction followed by a vocal line displaying a fragmented melody. The second section involves the pianist as vocalist as both performers are asked to participate in the forced whisper section that is spoken. During the second section, the pianist plucks random notes all the while adding glissandi inside the piano. The third section is a cadenza for voice with, without accompaniment, focusing on vocal flexibility and range. Shellhouse has said that his written cadenza is a basis for the vocalist and may be adapted. The fourth section occurs at the end of the cadenza, wherein the voice and piano are once again synchronized together. His intention was to write a composition that took the iambic tetrameter of the poem into account, but did not venture into monotony. The end result was to maintain, quote, equilibrium, not balance, where the accents even out the unaccented syllables. Brook Song and On the Capture and Imprisonment of Crazy Snake were composed during the summer of 2006 and autumn of 2007, respectively, by Kimberly Sizer. Brook Song is simple in its composition. It's a short song which focuses on the quiet nature of the Brook Song. As the poetry states, the Brook is small and must be listened to closely to hear its song. That is the emphasis of the composition. It is simple in style, staid and calm. On the capture and imprisonment of Crazy Snake, in contrast, provides a large dramatic gesture, encompassing a range from G3 to B flat five, as well as demanding different styles of singing and a large range of dynamics. The composition is more like an impassioned opera aria than a gentle art song than the gentle art song quality of Brook Song. The composition is as drastic as the poetry, which never deviates from honoring the conservative Muscogee Crazy Snake. Crazy Snake was Chida Oharjo, the leader of the Crazy Snake movement, which lasted from 1900 to 1909. Harjo was an orator, or Miko, for a small minority of mostly full-blooded Muscogees who opposed the US government mandated tribal allotments of land. A political activist for the rights of the native people, Harjo was dedicated to his cause and was often charged and arrested for his beliefs. Because of Harjo's association with some freedmen who had come into trouble with local law officials because of accusations of theft, a violent shootout occurred. It is most likely that Harjo died as a result of injuries sustained therein. Harjo was known to be a brilliant orator and a man who stood by his beliefs, characteristics which Posey celebrates in this poem. The positive acknowledgement of the native traits of coarse black hair and eagle eye gives praise to Crazy Snake's challenging of European American ideology. Moving on, the next piece is my personal favorite and you'll see why. I composed Hot Gun on the Death of Yudeka Harjo during the summer of 2006. It is based upon the only known poem by Alex Posey that is written in dialect or pidgin English. The, character, uh, the characters that appear in the poem, such as Hot Gun, Yadeka Harjo, Waxi Harjoki, and Hot Ulk Mafla, are taken from Posey's opus, The Fuss Fixico Letters. This chamber work is a modified dirge set in A minor for voice, double bass, and piano. It is intentionally sparse so as to feature the rather unique poetry. Even though the composition is simple, there are melodic themes that are used throughout to purposely lead the listener with a haunting, unfulfilled feeling at the end of the composition, similar to the experience of mourning. The composition opens with a piano introduction, which features the melody in its entirety. The only other time that the whole melody is played is in the bass postlude. The voice and piano form a duet through the out the composition with double bass and piano interludes, which propel the textual ideas forward. The double bass is played utilizing slapping for two reasons. The first is to feature the skills of my brother, Zachary Kunkel. As a rockabilly double bass player, he specializes in slap bass technique. Secondly, the style adds an earthy, more folk-like quality to the otherwise staunch and straightforward dirge. When the idea of using slap bass was first suggested to me by Zach, I could immediately envision how the composition would be enhanced by the addition of the style and the instrument. 
So this next piece is Hot Gun on the Death of Yudeka Harjo by yours truly. And also, as soon as I can figure out how to minimize this, here we go. Um, and also um, featuring my brother on double bass and Patrick Harvey. This was the world premiere and it was played one more time and I'll tell you about that later.
Okay, so yay, thank you. Um, <laughs> that after that was intermission, and then we had Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta was composed during the summer and autumn of 2006 by Jason Leinick. A composition for classical, classical guitar and voice, Mount Shasta has the distinction of being the only work from the premiere to not incorporate the piano and thus not technically be an art song. The song focuses on word painting with prime musical examples being the lower middle voice vocal line at Shasta's bass and the melismatic passage at the word, words monarch light. This composition is also based on the motive that is first heard in the guitar introduction. This theme varies throughout the composition, but the general aesthetic of creating an atmosphere of the great Mount Shasta in California, the volcano during the nighttime scene remains the same throughout. The composition is intended to be played in drop D, which creates a warmer, more melancholy sound. The voice and guitar often work together through trading of melody, which weaves from one section to another very seamlessly. Cliff J was the guitarist for the premiere of Mount Shasta. Ode to Sequoia was composed during the summer of 2006 by Daniel Thomas McDonough. McDonough chose to set this poem because it was of particular interest to me as a historically based text. Ode to Sequoia is the longest single composition from the premiere. The accompaniment is sparse and the vocal line is incredibly disjunct, alternating melodic motives with the piano. Although the composition is tonal, the aesthetic is similar to works by Webern or Schoenberg. While the vocal line features large intervallic leaps and the creation of tone cl clusters with the piano, the emphasis on the text is still apparent because of the rather sparse accompaniment. Sequoia, 1767 to 1843, is remembered for being the inventor of the Cherokee syllabary, different from, differing from an alphabet because it is based upon syllables. Because of Sequoia's work, the five civilized tribes were able to have written languages. As a native poet, journalist, and linguist, it is apparent why Posey would find it important to honor such a man. Wadi refers to General Stand Wadi, 1806 to 1871, of the Cherokee Confederate Army in the Indian Territory. His brother, Galagina Wadi, 1800 to 1839, later known as Elias Boudinot, was a Cherokee who started in Ed started and edited the tribe's first newspaper, Cherokee Phoenix. The original Cadmus in Greek mythology was credited with the creation of the Phoenician alphabet. Sequoia was compared to him and called the Cherokee Cadmus. Songs of Life and Time were composed during the summer of 2006 by Daniel J. Nags. After the premiere, these songs were also performed in their entirety by pianist Elena Reyepkina and me for Egopo Classic Theater's Midsummer Gala in Philadelphia, as well as with Susan Ha at Lincoln University. These six songs comprise the only song cycle in the premiere, as the chosen texts tell the story of various moments in a person's life. Rather than fitting any particular Native American stereotypes with this, these compositions, Nags feels that the songs embody an almost Scottish feel throughout. To a Common Flower opens the song cycle. The song features an exuberant joy at the new life of a flower. Comparing the flower to the human, Posey infers that the flower's life is sweet. They will never know the pain or the sorrow of a broken heart. Nag set this text as a happy thought, opening in a vibrant E major. The text is set in a short amount of time with a long Schumann-like postlude leading to the second song. Eyes of Blue and Brown tells this tale of a person in love with a blue-eyed and thus foreign person, forsaking, forsaken for the love of a brown-eyed person and thus a native. This composition has an Americana folk-like quality, similar in style to that of John Jacob Niles. The simplicity of the vocal line is enhanced with an increasingly elaborate accompaniment as the composition progresses. The simplicity lingers until the text changes to, quote, but when one day two eyes of brown, unquote, occurs. When the accompaniment becomes staccato, contrasting greatly with the lyric quality thus far. And I would like to share that one with you. Um, I think that's one that appeals to many people. And it also is very uh, evident what Posey was trying to say in the, in the lyrics and the poetry itself. 
Eyes of Blue and Brown. This one does not have a video. It just has the audio, but you'll see a picture of me. You also see a picture of Posey in this. Okay, so that was uh, recorded with Susan Ha at Lincoln University. And next, the third song in the song cycle, Songs of Life and Time, is At the Siren's Call. It depicts a stormy sea where the singer feels overwhelmed at being surrounded by the voices of the sirens. This text is quintessential posy, focusing on the basis of human nature and pondering life among the elements. The fast moving piano accompaniment is complemented by the highly chromatic nature of the vocal line. Nearly strophic, the second verse becomes broader and more vibrant than the first, ending in a crashing wave of fortissimo going to a distinctly subito piano to finish the poet's thoughts. If anyone is interested in hearing this whole song cycle, it is available on YouTube. I just uh, know I didn't have time to play them all. To My Wife is an incredibly melancholy poem, which nags set as a through composed composition based on various themes. A piano introduction sets up this song as a happy sweet theme in F major, which opens up and becomes broader and sweeter as the song continues. Halfway through the composition, the song becomes more of a thought about a person as opposed to the life that the singer has lived. Nags marks the second verse of the poem as ashamed. Hearing the tonality change, here the tonality changes from F to F minor and the musical themes change. 
the true meaning of the composition becomes evident. This text is about regret in life. The singer discusses hurting his loved one, but eventually appreciating the enduring faithfulness of his wife. Nags discussed his interpretation of the poem, quote, Posey acknowledges his wife's faithfulness, for she has always stood by his side, yet he has still neglected her. One hopes his regret compels him to change, but also one also knows that not every story has a happy ending. The poet's life is brought to an untimely end when he drowns at the age of 35. As such, he may never have had time to change his behavior toward his wife, and perhaps he wanted us to avoid the same mistakes with those whom we love while we still have life and time, end quote. Midsummer contrasts completely with To My Wife. This text focuses on enjoying nature, hunting, and the good life. The tone is excited and the tempo moves very quickly, with a quarter note at metronome marking 120 and later at 150. Providing a challenge for the accompanist, the composition is broad and expansive for the singer, featuring triplets and quintuplets in the accompaniment, contrasting the long lines of the voice, the composition has a genuine feeling of exhilaration throughout. What I Ask of Life concludes a cycle opening with a long introduction, setting a mood of reflection and pleasantness. The text enters over a broken arpeggiation of triplets. The vocal line is fluid, long and bright, focusing on the positive meaning in life. The composition broadens when singing is mentioned and features a high subito piano to discuss old age. The interludes are thickly textured, but the harmonies remain relatively simple throughout. The text ends in the most optimistic and hopeful way, which is complemented and finished with repeat motives in the piano postlude. Nag stated that he chose to end the cycle with this poem because it, quote, summarized summarizes Posey's philosophical outlook on life well, end quote. Here is what I ask of life. Again, this is the final song of Songs of Life and Time by Daniel Nags. This is again with Susan Ha at Lincoln University.
Okay. So that was the last song on Songs of Life and Time by Daniel J. Nags. To date, none of these songs have been published, to my knowledge, but all of the compositions are available from the individual composers. The world premiere live recording and the sheet music for the 16 premiered songs were acquired by the Merkel Area Museum in Merkel, Texas, and by the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., because of commissioning and premiering these compositions based on Posey's poetry, I was added to the list of classical Native American artists and musicians at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian. In January of 2010, I also premiered a song cycle entitled Reflections and Musings, composed by Nicole Elise DiPaolo. She was the one who composed Nature's Blessings and A Vision, which I played at the beginning. The Posey poems used for this song cycle were flowers to a summer cloud, a reverie, an outcast, and to a snowflake. These songs were composed with the intention of setting a mood of different seasons, along with an emphasis on retaining the original poetry. DiPaolo's goal was to allow, quote, Posey's wonderfully musical, vivid poetry to shine through, end quote. I have a very short example uh, from, from that premiere. This is to a snowflake. This is at Shorter College with Jericho Vasquez at piano. Shorter College is in Georgia. It is my intention to continue to promote the works of Posey through song literature. Repeat performances as well as videos of the original premiere are being made available on YouTube. Through this project of bringing Native American poetry to attention through Western classical, classical music, it is hoped that new collaborations and ideas will be encouraged to be developed to unite the current Native American and European and modern American cultures and beyond. Before I turn this back over to Brenton, um, I wanted to tell you about a recent experience I had that ties all of this together so nicely. I was hired by Intermountain Opera Bozeman as part of an all Native American concert, all classical Native American concert. We had three um, Native American opera singers there. We had the foremost probably current um, Native American composer there. And we also had a couple of virtual performances. We had a couple traditional uh, performers as well. And that was called Circle of Resilience. And I did this in May in Bozeman, Montana. Um, it was recorded by Montana PBS. And on that program, I had the honor of performing with two amazing instrumentalists, Jared Tate, who was the composer I mentioned, and Julia Slovarp, who is a cellist at uh, the university there in Bozeman. And we did one of Jared's pieces called Hojo, um, which is in Navajo and English. And it's about COVID, actually, and how COVID affected the Navajo people on the reservation. But also, we also performed my piece, Hot Gun, on the death of Yudeka Harjo. And that was the first time I have gotten to perform that 
since its premiere. Um, Julia did not know how to play slut bass, but she taught herself for that performance. If you are interested in um, hearing those, uh, they've already done the rebroadcast. However, those two pieces will be released as part of the election returns for uh, the Muskogee tribal elections, uh, Muskogee Media, which is M-V-S-K-O-K-E, Muskogee um, Media, has a YouTube page, and you can definitely check it out there. September 18th is the preliminary elections, and then they have their final elections in November. So I'm so excited to bring those pieces to a new audience, and hopefully some Muskogee people specifically who may not realize that there is any tie to classical music at all. So I'm very excited to be able to be someone to bridge that gap. So if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to talk about the Kunkel name. I'm happy to talk about what it's like to be um, an American Indian in today's classical musical world. I'm happy to talk about whatever you have questions about. And I hope that you uh, found this this lecture interesting and different from what you may have heard before. It's very personal for me, so I hope it was enjoyable. What was the last thing that you mentioned? The connection just went out just a little bit. Just say okay. that just the last two, yeah. three minutes, it, it said it was performed for and then it cut out. Just say that okay. one more time. So, yes. So the concert was called Circle of Resilience with Intermountain Opera Bozeman. I did it in Mo uh, Montana in May and it was recorded by Montana PBS, they did a lot, uh, they did a streamed concert, but it will also have the two trios from that concert with Jared Tate, who is the premier composer in the indigenous world right now um, for Native American works and um, Julia Slovar, who is on faculty at, I believe Montana State. And the three of us did that together. And we did a Hojo, which was by Jared about COVID in the Navajo Nation. And we also did My Hot Gun on the Death of Yadaka Harjo. They will be rebroadcast by Muskogee Media um, for the tribal election returns in September and November. And I'm very excited about that. Very good. Let's give her a hand, Dr. Pearson. Thank you. So I'm gonna open it up to any residents that have a question. If you have a question, I'm gonna just ask you to raise your hand. It could be a question about really anything. It doesn't even have to be the topic, but this is a very interesting topic. Um, and it's it, really a wonderful um, dissertation. I was thoroughly impressed. Um, so if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, we'll get to you. All right. Hold on, here you go. Ahead. Has he met you? Have I met her? Yes, yes. we've worked together. We met in Lancaster. Oh, yes. so we worked together. Okay, so we've we have met her many class. times, actually. Yes, I, I enjoyed this very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you. Good. Okay. Yes, I really enjoy your music and everything. I would like to know: Do you have relatives in Illinois? The um, name Conkle, farmer. To my knowledge, no. However, my father says that we are all. I'm not sure, but the somehow. name sounds so familiar. <laughs> and I knew well, them personally. They are farmer. They live in the southwest of, uh, uh, of Illinois. Okay. Um, I so far know, away from I here. Personally, my, um, my family, for, on my father's side, um, it, it's, the name is Pennsylvania Dutch, um, Allentown, PA area, and then ended up in Ohio. I don't think... no, Sorry. I find out what they, from and I'll let, I'll let you know. Yeah, there's a couple Kunkels, so I don't think it's yeah. the right one. Sometimes Kunkel, there's... There are a few right. different spellings. We're all related somehow down the line, I've heard. So the K-O-N, the K-U-N-K-E-L, I think they're all uh, similar, similar lines. Good. I, enjoy, I enjoy your music. Thank you it's so wonderful. much. wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Italian, I think at home. <laughs> she loves Italian music. I mean, we watch tons of Italian operas here. Fabulous. Pavarotti. Benjamino Gigli. Talk about Pavarotti. Pavarotti, he likes to eat lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the town, the town. The town is Modena, province of Modena. It's a nice little city, and he's got a beautiful, beautiful voice. He was 
a little bit younger than I, uh, he used to sing in church. And when he was singing to me, oh, it was fantastic. I tell you, he's a nice, very nice man. He's got a beautiful voice. Yes. So that's awesome. Yeah. Another question, Alan? Okay. Yeah, I have to, uh, I guess I'm, I'm really interested in, in a lot of the, uh, uh, the getting closer attachment to the meaning, uh, getting tra get translations of any of the of the text of the poetry. I write some poetry myself, so I also I, I was involved in a choir uh, in Houston, Texas, that sang uh, the International Voices of Houston. Uh, they sung folk music from around the world in the original languages. They presented, they also have probably eight different concerts on on YouTube for, and they're trying to get together. But So I can appreciate some of the, the feelings. I was in it for nine years. So uh, uh, of all of the feeling, of the expression of the uh, intricacy. So I, I'd like to know if there were, if it, it's possible to get any English translations of any uh, line by line so uh, we could uh, understand exactly the, at least I could Well, understand. it's in English. It, yeah, the meaning. in English. In English, right. So she, oh. they're asking for if there was like um, text. Yes, so, could, so we could have the, the uh, poetry is all published. All of those songs are published in a book of poetry by Posey. The actual YouTube videos have subtitles, obviously, um, but you would have seen them. But um, yes, you uh, you absolutely can see the poetry. It is published. It is available. You can actually find everything online. Um, if you want to just Google it, Brenton, you can find that and all of them will come up. Uh, the only one that's really any different to listen to and read is Hot Gun uh, because it's in Pigeon English. Everything else is in traditional English. Very good. Very nice question. Does anybody else have a question for Dr. Kirsten Kunkel? Yes. Is there a reason why teenagers are not interested in religion today? In religion? In <laughs> religion. Um, that might be out, outside of my realm of uh, full... full uh, <laughs> that might be a question for me. No, that might not be a question. Do you, have a question about, do you have a question about the, you know, the topic or about her life? <laughs> or, well, about the country. I was wondering if there was a real ease of transfer from east to west to settle this country. Did it happen miraculously or without? Is this all? Hypothetical. Are you talking about? Let me, I'm trying to understand the question here. I'm let me. Sorry. Well, what I can address, <laughs> Brenton, which I might be part of the question. Um, that that sounds like a broad question. Okay. That, but what I can do is, um, I can tell you a little bit about my tribe. So I am. I'm a big old melting pot of cultures. I, I am Polish, I'm German, I'm Irish, and I'm also Muscogee. So the Muscogee people were one of the five civilized tribes, and originally they had been in Florida area, um, along with the Cherokee and the Chickasaw and some others, Seminoles. And during the Great Migration, which is one of the many ways that they uh, call what happened during the Trail of Tears, um, under Andrew Jackson's presidency, the, the people were forced to walk to new lands, which is where you find the reservations. My tribe ended up settling in Oklahoma. Um, I am from Ohio. Um, my family does come from Oklahoma on that side. My grandfather and great grandmother, uh, Posey's line, are, are Oklahoma based. Um, but um, yeah, so the, the Trail of Tears, if you don't know about it, it was pretty horrific. Um, basically, people forced to walk um, to these new lands thousands and thousands of miles and um, through awful conditions, basically treated less than human and then put on reservations where land had not been really cultivated. So um, that is kind of how I think I can answer that question in relation to what's going on with um, with 
English. with the native side. I'm not sure if that answers your question fully, but hopefully that gives you a little insight. Does that answer your question? Well, I have teenage grandsons and they're both part Native American, Cherokee from Oklahoma. And I'm wondering what's happening to them with religion. So, okay. so religion in, um, in Native cultures is, is very, I mean, there are varying degrees of what has happened with religion. Um, a lot of it is very Christianity based. A lot of that has to do with missionaries. Um, you may have heard recently in the news about the, the uh, residential schools, the boarding schools. Um, around the time of the Dawes Commission, which Posey was very, very involved in, um, you had a lot of people claiming their blood allotments were different than what they are. They tried to make it seem like they had lesser amounts of native blood because if they had a certain amount, their children would be taken away and sent to these residential schools. Now, these residential schools were often based in Christianity um, as missionary schools. So with that, they were taught to not speak their language. They were taught to only speak English. They were taught to be raised as Christians. So what's happened with the, the native cultures is that many of them are deeply rooted in Baptist cultures or similar um, Protestant religions. Um, it has morphed from the Christian religions to a more contemporary Baptist or other Protestant religion base. So that kind of answers, I think, a little bit of what's going on with the religions. There are religion um, aspects to Native culture that um, are retained somewhat, um, but it depends on the people, of course. But as a whole, I would say, from my experience, um, I see more Baptist and Protestant Native Americans than anything else. I, I happen to be, if you're interested, Roman Catholic. But that is, again, also from my father's side. I have one 22-year-old in New Jersey. He's got a girlfriend in New Jersey. He's happy. I have the other one who's fixated on Shakespeare, and her name is Cordelia. <laughs> Cordy, <laughs> and she's from the Philippines, so they're all settled already. Okay, okay. Okay, very good, very good. That was interesting. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, just one more question. About, I know it's a reference to Sequoia and, and development of the Cherokee alphabet. Yes. Uh, how, much, how much further would that, that actually uh, produce any more uh, growth and an understanding of that language uh, of his. And I also noticed that the description of it, of it being uh, based on syllables mm -hmm. uh, and happened to been studying also in the, in a Tibetan script and a Tibetan language, their, their language, the pictures are also based on symbols on, mm -hmm. on, uh, on uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, syllables of, of the words. And I was a little surprised at the, the similar fragmentation, uh, but uh, did that go any further in, in the development of the language uh, of the what Sequoias were, or sure. is it sort of? Just, no, I mean, uh, the Cherokee have, a, have their own language. Um, it is a complete language. It is written and it is spoken as well. Um, it's the Cherokee are one of the bigger tribes that still recognize uh, quite a few people as far as having representation. Um, there are five quote civilized tribes that they call. And by civilized, I mean that they have a, their own written language. Um, my tribe is one of them, the Muskogee are another one. Um, I do not speak Muskogee, but I do know a few words. Um, I know a few phrases here and there. Um, I, I wish I knew more. I'm hoping that the more that I am involved in affairs in Oklahoma, I am a tribal voting citizen. Um, so hopefully the more I can get involved with that, um, the more I can pick up. Um, that being said, yes. Um, so yes, they have their own language, complete language that is based upon 
what um, Sequoia created. And as far as um, being syllable based versus alphabet, that is just what I know from reading it. I, I don't speak any Cherokee, although I have sung a song in it. Um, actually, it was a song that was sung on the Trail of Tears, and I learned it from uh, one of the singers at that Circle of Resilience concert, Kate Morton. So she learned it from her teacher, who is Barbara McAllister, who was a Metropolitan Opera singer and is also a Cherokee. So um, I, I think that answers your question. I'm not sure if I covered everything, but um, that that's the gist of it, I think. Well, there, there was one other thing that uh, I, st I stumbled across, the sand painting used by Navajos. Mm -hmm. uh, on the side, I found out that uh, the the original reason for the sand paintings was that it was a, a prescription, and it was a way of the the shamans used of transmitting the the mixture of herbs from one generation to another without using language, huh. and that uh, the colors used in the sand were each of the herbs and that they would, uh, when somebody was ill, they would come and, and the shaman would make a particular painting. And, and so it's the, the type of painting and uh, what the color of the herbs, this guy, what was the prescription for that illness? Then the patient was supposed to eat the painting. So that's why oh. very few survive to this day. And yeah, so I, I hadn't heard that. Interesting. I don't know anything about that. Yeah, unfortunately yeah, not. Well, that's why I was beginning to wonder if there was any any other uh, uh, associated meanings to some of the uh, uh, the language that they use. Uh, but apparently, there's not. It might. Well, so it, it, to my knowledge, there's nothing specific like that. I mean, but I didn't know about that. Um, but, you know, the Native people tended to do everything with with meaning behind it. I mean, every part of an animal is used. If they were going to kill an animal, they were going to use every part. Same with their culture. Everybody was very, you know, everybody was very helpful to everyone to create a society and a community. So, I mean, it would make sense that whatever they're doing they're doing with intention and purpose but i can't give you concrete examples i'm sorry it's just not my not but, my forte well, there uh, yeah it's probably buried in the unrecorded history of these peoples yeah well thank yeah. you anyway sure yeah, very good that's, that sounds any other like, questions um, i have a, yeah. yeah i have a, a question couple. for I'll um, keep it short anybody else well, i wanted to ask about kit carson is, are the stories that he told true? I'm sorry, who? Kit Carson. Oh, I don't know. Kit I don't Carson. know anything about Kit Carson. Do you, Brenton? Supposedly. I wish I did. I don't. I we don't. Look it up I'm sorry. Sometime. Yeah. I, the okay. name sounds familiar, but I don't know him. I'm sorry. Good, good, good. good. Any other question? Good. I could talk about the musicianship. So no one talked about the music. Um, <laughs> So good. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but I'll, you know, this has been really enjoyable. Uh, let's see here through composers. Um, the, so these are first, let's talk about Alexander Pulsey because I don't know much about him. I looked him up a little bit as you were presenting a lecture. Could you talk a little bit about him for those who might not know of his background and his poetry? Okay, so the short version is, is that he was, um, he was very, very prolific when he was younger. He had a very tragic life. Um, he, he had children die young. Um, he only lived to be 35. He died in a flood while he was trying to find land for his people and trying to make sure they got their proper allotments during the Dawes Commission. Um, he was an orator. He was a journalist. He was a poet. He um, was very torn between, do I accept the new ways of modern American men and, and women of the, you know, of that time and embrace English and things like that? Or do I try to hold on to my culture? He was very interested in bridging that gap and making sure that while he embraced the new, that he also didn't lose 
the culture and the heritage. And he wanted to bring his people along with him into the modern age. So I think that that kind of sums up what he did a lot. His big opus writing was the Fuss Fixed Co Letters. Um, that involves a lot of satire, a lot of political satire. And the hot gun poem that I used is actually written in prose form in the Fuss Fixed Co Letters. So um, it's a lot of it's in dialect, in pidgin English. And he was intentionally making fun of people that other people in the area would know. Um, you know, so local celebrities and things like that and and just poking fun at them and also, um, you know, getting in-depth and intense, but in a more, um, com not comedic way, but like a more um, satirical way. And so that is really his most famous publication. You can find it, it is published. Um, Posey's biggest biographer is Daniel Littlefield. And I think that more than anything, Littlefield has summed up his life in all of his, his writings. There was nothing I could add to it. I found out most of my own family history through Littlefield's research, to be very honest. Um, so my, um, my relationship with him is that he was my great, great, great uncle. So what does that mean? That means he was my mother's father's mother's uncle. Do you follow that? Mother's oh, father's wow. mother's uncle. Yeah. And so um, my my mother's father's mother's father actually was um, was kind of like the bad boy of the family. He he uh, got in a lot of trouble and things like that. But his brother, Alex, was was pretty cut and dry and, and a great poet. He was actually considered the poet laureate of the tribe. Now, um, also a Muscogee is Joy Harjo, and she's our third time poet laureate for the United States. She's currently the poet laureate. And that, I don't believe that's ever happened before to have a three time poet laureate. So that's a really big deal for the Muscogee people and also for just representation of women and Muscogees and indigenous people in the arts. And so, um, yeah, so that's Posey. That's a little bit on him. Wow, just fascinating stuff. Um, learning so much from this. I mean, this is just incredible. Um, I loved Mother Son. I mean, it, it, so these are different composers that decided to take these poems and write with these poems that Alexander Posey did. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of premiered these songs. So correct? I actually commissioned all of these to be written for me. Um, so, yeah. So I took, uh, this was a big project that I wanted to take on during my final year of my doctorate. We had three recitals that were required and this was my final recital. Um, and I wanted to do something that was special and unique. And this came to me on a drive back from Ann Arbor to Ohio one time. And it just kind of was, you know, like they have those light bulb moments. I was like, that's what I need to do. It had never been done. Um, Posey wasn't, it wasn't well known to the masses, although he is known in, in native literature and I knew his poems were great. So I started doing research um, and there's, there was, there is research out there. There's not a lot of research. It took a lot of phone calls to the Gilcrease Museum in Oklahoma and things like that. It, there is more now, and there was is much more accessibility now than there was when I did this in 2006 and 2007. Um, at that time, you could find some things on Google, but not a lot. This is right around the time I discovered Wikipedia, if that gives you any sense of like time frame. Um, yeah, right around that time. Yeah, and of course, you know, Wikipedia was not what it is now. So, yeah, that would be great. Um, so the the I think it's the mother song. It's the second song that you did. Yes. you kind of turned your body towards the piano. Was yes. it something like a kind of like a George Crumb type thing where you sing some and there's others where they you sing in the piano or was it just a character? No, reason no, it was a sing into the piano. He wanted it sung into the piano for I the thought it acoustics. Was. Yep. Is it something to do with the poem or why does it turn into okay the so um it, the line is I hear and then there's a chord in the piano and it's meant to hold with the pedal the the sound of me singing here and let it fade away. And with the with it singing into the piano, 
a distant melody. So it finishes a line, a distant melody. So it's meant to fade off. Yep. Very good. And when you sing in a piano, it, in a grand piano, there's an echo. Oh, and so you'll hear that you, unfortunately it's not live. You can't really hear it in a recording per se, but sometime just sing a note. We have a grand piano at Linden Hall. Just go to Linden Hall sing one note and hold that sustain pedal and you'll hear a reverb and echo. And that's, I think, kind of the idea. I think that's what it was. It was a hundred percent the idea. And, you know, we did that. Uh, yeah, you didn't hear the recording, but pity was also like that where the, the pianist and I both spoke into the piano and he would pluck notes inside the piano. Uh, very 20th century technique there. Um, you know, that, yes. that, you know, we have these beautiful art songs that you heard mostly those kind, but then there were some definitely 20th century techniques that were used in that concert as well. I just don't have uh, great recordings of those, unfortunately. So, you know, they're not on YouTube. Yes. Okay, good. Well, you might have to get them sometime in the future. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, so let's see. So the third song, this is the one with the hot gun song. Yes, that's mine. One of, residents, as you were, one of the residents that, um, as the song was being played, was like, I never heard a, a song like that. <laughs> like they had a piano and voice, and then you had a slap bass. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you never heard, I mean, all the art songs, I've heard thousands of art songs. I've never once heard an art song like that. I mean, you hear them in jazz stuff, but it's clever. Um, so like, well, I guess like, I'm looking at the resident's face right now and I'll probably think of what you're thinking, but why like a slap bass? Why, why, you know, what makes that, um, so there's a with posy poetry or there's a couple of reasons. Um, the, the main reason is because my brother wanted to be involved in this piece and that's what he plays. And so I wanted it to work, but that's not the only reason when he, that was his suggestion. And so I incorporated it, but the poem itself, and I, I've mentioned this before in other in other realms, is that you've got Hot Gun. Hot Gun's a man, and he's talking to his friends, and he's talking about his friend Yadeka Harjo who died. He's got Waxi Harjoki. He's got Hadok M. Mathla. He's got all these other people at around him that he's talking to, and the way I envision this piece is that you've got a bunch of these native elders that are sitting around a campfire. And these native elders, if you've ever been around them, they don't say much. They're very quiet people, generally speaking. They look, they observe, and when they say something, it has meaning. So in my vision of this, you have Hot Gun talking about this friend. And this is his, basically, this is his chance to talk about his friend after he has died. And he's just sitting around this campfire and then, you know, if you're sitting around a campfire, sometimes someone has a guitar or some other instrument and they just kind of pluck and they play around. They might not actually be doing anything, but there's that sound. So we have that repeated melody that just is kind of there. You add it in with the voice and you add it in with the piano. I sang the entire thing straight tone because that's the kind of feeling I wanted. I didn't want it to be an operatic sound. I didn't want it to be a very westernized sound. To me, it needed to match the pidgin English. And to me, that meant it had to be earthy. It had to be something that was accessible. And to me, slap bass is very accessible. It may not be traditional, but it's very accessible. People like it. People think it's fun or appealing. And to me, the slap bass echoes kind of a guitar feel to it. It just has that feeling of, I'm just playing around, I'm messing around on a guitar in between somebody talking. Did it have like a jazz feel to the music? Like, was there any jazz influence or was it no pure, you know? It, be, it, was, it was not meant to be jazz. I, I've had people call it a jazz piece. I don't think of it as a jazz piece. It's not improvised. Um, it, it is all written, um, but it's, with, it, the notes are written. The slapping is improvised, if that makes sense. But it's not like some like, Gershwin influence or like some jazz 
No, I, I literally sat down, created a melody and then put harmony to it and then decided where the vocal line would take off and the bass line would take over. And that's really what I did with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. It's very fascinating. I mean, it's just the whole thing is just great. And um, we want to thank you so much. This has been enjoyable and and really great. So let's give her a hand. Thank Dr. you. Pearson, come for my friend. <laughs> thank you, Brenton. A wonderful toddler, by the way. She's great. I look at the she's pictures so on Facebook. Cute. She's great. Feel free to show off her picture. That's yeah. fine. All right. Well, thank you so much. And, and thank Jason's you a great me. guy. <laughs> well, we put up thank with you. Him. So, <laughs> so thank you. Stay on the line. We're going to stop recording, and then we'll probably get a picture and we'll post okay, it on Facebook. Great. Great. Um, so, um, so our next talk our next person that i invited is september and that is dr erica glenn who is the byu hawaii director of choral activities so now she'll present her music uh i don't know what her topic is going to be yet but it'll probably be something choral something vocal health and um she's originally from utah she's a wonderful another wonderful friend and musician friend and now we'll go from the art song realm into the choir realm. And uh, it's really great. So uh, that will be in September. So we want to thank you, Dr. Kirsten Kunkel, and take care. Thank you.